Chapter 27 of Over the Hills and Far Away, a story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. Goodbye. Little Mrs. Meredith had come into luncheon in an unhappy frame of mind. Her yellow locks were slightly ruffled out of their usual satin sleekness. Dreadful to relate, there was a suspicion of a frisette visible at one side of her head, and she had forgotten to put on her long gold and coral earrings. All these were very unusual circumstances with her, and signs of some uncommon mental disturbance. But, in addition, she ate her mutton chop with a woebegone countenance, and sighed so deeply as she helped Clinton to green peas that he felt obliged to ask her at last what was the matter. Then out came a tremendous grievance. It's nearly a fortnight since my picnic, Jeanie moaned, and during all that time I've never seen Lucy. I thought she would certainly have come over this morning, such a lovely day too, but she hasn't, and I think it's very strange. She knows I wanted her to help me make my new silk dress, for I told her so while you were mixing the salad and Dr. Dacre was unpacking the knives and forks. Don't you remember? No, I don't in the least, replied Clinton, and I think it is very likely that the knives and forks put it out of Miss Cunningham's head. Jeanie did not catch the point of this speech at all. She cast a regretful glance at her sewing machine in a corner of the room, with a pile of glistening gold-coloured pieces of silk beside it, and went on with her remarks. I've had to cut that dress by myself now, and I've cut the back wrong, and wasted ever so much of the stuff. I shouldn't have done it if Lucy had been here, and I think it is very unkind of her, and she does not love me as she did Effie. This was quite true, if Jeanie had only known it. Lucy never did love any girl again like she had done Effie. Unto her there was no second friend, but Jeanie did not in her heart believe anything of the kind, though she professed to do so when provoked. Clinton sat at the foot of the table, listening very passively to his wife's grievances. He was thinking, while she spoke, what an excellent kind were the new potatoes he had just bought, and how many dozen of plum trees he should send for next week to stock an unoccupied corner of his garden. He knew by experience that Jeanie's troubles were not likely to be very weighty ones, but he admired her extremely when she pouted and assumed her injured air. It gave her round, soft, childish face more expression, and was a kind of playing at being angry, which always struck him as rather charming. So, having finished his lunch, he sat back in his chair watching her, encouraging her to chatter to her heart's content, and rather wishing that someone might drop in and see her before the pink flush faded out of her cheeks and her blue eyes lost their pathetic expression. Jeanie was a dreadful little gossip. She told him a long story of how Mrs. Pryor had quarrelled with her new cook, to whom she was giving forty shillings a year, and how Mr. Cunningham was reported to have gone into a passion because someone had left his garden gate open, in consequence of which a cow had got in and eaten all the blossoms off the solitary quince tree, so that no quince jelly could be made that year. And I'm not sorry, she added, for it's horrid stuff and always tastes as if it were flavoured with onions. After this came a long account of Mrs. Somebody's baby, who had got red hair, and lastly, she informed her husband that everyone was saying Lucy was engaged to Dr. Dacre, and asked if he believed the report to be true. For it's very odd I'm not told if it is so, quoth Jeanie, bridling up with a fresh sense of inquiry. Clinton winced a little, a very little. It was only a twinge of wounded vanity. He got up, went over, and kissed his little wife. She's a jolly little thing, he said to himself, and prettier than Lucy after all. Thus fortified, he felt capable of continuing the subject. If they're not engaged, I should say they soon will be, he replied to the question put to him. It's one of the clearest cases I ever saw in my life. And behold, the words were hardly out of his mouth when, looking through the window, he perceived Dacre himself riding up the gravel drive to the front door. Clinton ran out to meet him. He had a real liking for Dacre, in spite of the jealous pangs which the other man had once or twice caused him. He did not wish Lucy to remain faithful to himself any more, but still it was mortifying at times to find how completely she had forgotten him. Still, in spite of this, he could not help liking Dacre, and would have seconded Mr. Cunningham's opinion of him. A thoroughly good fellow, and a gentleman, any day. There must have been something lovable about Rilston Dacre. The two men came in together, and Jeanie, who had discovered meanwhile that her earrings were missing, and flown to put them on, received Dacre very cordially. "'I'm so glad to see you,' she said. "'Sit down and have some luncheon, please. "'Have you been to Mongarewa, and have you brought me a message from Lucy?' Dacre was all but guilty of the rudeness of turning his back upon her. He had dropped his whip, however. When he had picked it up, he looked round and said, No, he had not the pleasure of seeing Miss Cunningham since the day of the picnic. Well, I wonder whatever she has been doing, said Jeanie indignantly. She seems to have cut all her friends lately. I think I shall go over to Maungarewa tomorrow and give her a piece of my mind. 
While Dacre took his luncheon, Jeanie seated herself opposite to him in her favourite easy chair, with some delicate lace embroidery which she was rather clever at executing in her hand. She chatted away briskly, according to her custom, upon all sorts of subjects, and Dacre listened, and was as much amused as usual. He liked Mrs. Meredith, partly for her own sake, and partly because, if not the rose, she had dwelt near her. So, a little for the sake of seeing again Jeanie's pretty face, but chiefly in order that he might at least hear a few words about Lucy once more, though he might not see her, he had come to wish Jeanie goodbye before he sailed for England. He told her, when he had finished his lunch, that it was a farewell visit, and asked her if he could do anything for her at home. Jeanie was really grieved at the idea. "'Going home,' she said. "'You are not in earnest, surely?' "'Yes, I am,' returned Dacre. "'I am really going home.' Jeanie had by this time become impressed with the idea that some change had passed over him since she had seen him last. She could not make out wherein it lay, however. There was no decided difference in him that she could see. Perhaps, if anything, his brown face was a trifle thinner, and his manner graver than usual, but even of this she grew doubtful when he smiled, just in his old way, and said he was waiting her commands. What might he have the pleasure of sending her from London? Oh, said Jeanie, with the delighted flush and wide-open eyes of a child at the thought, I should like a set of croquet just like Lucy's. It shall come out by the first ship, replied Dacre. The Merediths wanted him to remain the night at their house, but he refused. I am going on tonight, he said, to see Lewis Cunningham before I go. I must be on board the steamer in two days, so my time is growing very short. Goodbye, old fellow. Goodbye, Mrs. Meredith. I hope you won't quite forget me. Jeanie had never known before how much she liked him. She was ready to cry. Do, do come back again some day, she said, clasping her hands and looking up into his face. Dacre smiled again, a strange smile. No, he said, when I go, I shan't come back. But perhaps you will follow me, Mrs. Meredith, some day, and I shall see you there. Goodbye again. Mind you bring her to England some day, Clinton, and don't either of you forget me meanwhile. The instant the two gentlemen had gone out, Jeanie burst into tears. Lucy has refused him, she sobbed. I am sure she has. And oh, I wonder how she could have had the heart to do it. End of chapter 27 Recording by Lewis Fletcher Chapter 28 of Over the Hills and Far Away A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher The Picture Clinton, when he came in again, was quite of the same opinion as his wife. He, too, had noticed a change in Dacre, and fully believed him to be a rejected suitor of Lucy Cunningham's. The Merediths both fell into the identical delusion which Mrs. Pryor had only just recovered from with reference to her brother. Poor Lucy, what an amount of mischief she seemed destined to be charged with. A horrid shame it is, said Clinton, and Jeanie echoed the words, adding, After all the encouragement she gave him, too, and which I saw with my own eyes. Clinton felt for his part as if he could now think with more ease of certain passages in the past which he had not hitherto been fond of recalling to his memory. Lucy, by treating Dacre as he imagined her to have done, had suddenly lowered herself to his own level, and condoned his past faults by the action. He had never realised before how much he believed in Lucy, but he caught himself now thinking that if she had acted like this, the fault must be a venial one after all. And meanwhile, Dacre, blissfully unconscious of the scandal he had given rise to, was quietly proceeding on his way to Lewis Cunningham's house among the hills. It was a fine and very hot afternoon, with scarcely a breath of air, and he rode slowly, his thoughts busy with much that had occurred of late. He came at length to the place where he had last seen Laura. It was the day he met her riding with her sprained ankle, and she had rejected his help with contempt. He remembered perfectly her effort to anger him by her use of Lucy's name, and his own retaliation by reminding her of someone she could not easily have forgotten, and finally her acceptance, ungraciously enough, of his offer to pay her passage money to England. From that day to this he had seen and heard nothing more of her. She had sent him an address to which she wished the money to be forwarded, and he had carried out her desire to the letter. Afterwards he had received one line without signature, but in Laura's well-known writing, signifying the safe receipt of the cheque, and that was all. Riding round the base of the hill where he had encountered her, how clearly every incident of that past time rose up before his mind. He could see Laura now in her black riding habit and hat with its long black feather, her pale face and black hair, and the scorn of her great grey eyes all stood clear before him, even to the bunch of charms at her watch chain. The picture was touched in with perfect detail from the white gauntlets and silver fox-headed whip down to the velvet on her throat. 
It was an ugly scar, that, he thought, and she was always morbidly sensitive about it. She had a horror of the slightest disfigurement to her beautiful white skin. Once, I remember, she cut her hand a little and wore a glove for weeks until the very smallest trace of the scratch had disappeared. Musing thus, he rode steadily on until he came in sight at last of Lewis Cunningham's home. It was the same to which Mrs. Keith had once been assisted by Lucy. It was altered since then. A fancy to improve his house and garden had lately taken possession of Lewis, encouraged by his father, who had begun to form fresh matrimonial prospects on his son's behalf. Lewis did not suspect this, however, and, finding his father propitious, he had greatly improved and added to the rough little iron-roofed dwelling which he had inhabited for the last two years. Two new rooms, one with a bow window, had been added at the side, and a veranda, up which Honeysuckle had begun to climb, made it in appearance a very different dwelling to the one which had stood in the same spot formerly. Dacre fastened his horse to the gate, and made for the entrance door to be met on the threshold by his host, with outstretched hand and hearty cordial manner. Dacre felt at once that the other's pleasure in seeing him was genuine and sincere. Lewis, once won, was won forever. They had sworn an eternal friendship, and he at all events would not fail in his part of the agreement. Come in, old fellow, he said. I'm awfully glad to see you. You're just in time. And I'll send someone down to dispose of your horse. Of course you'll stay the night. He ushered Dacre first into the room that had been the only sitting room, but there was another now. This room had still Clytie on the mantelpiece, and the picture without a frame upon the wall above. It was much neater and more comfortable than of old, however. The chaos of newspapers, section plans, stock whips and spurs, which once covered a whole table in the corner, had disappeared. Everything was in its place, and, by consequence, the room looked twice as large as formerly. Dacre remarked it. I suppose you have changed your housekeeper, he remarked to his bachelor host. The one you have now must be a treasure. She has made everything so snug and jolly. Yes, replied Lewis. That's just about it. Hush, she's coming in. She came in with the tea things. A tall, large-featured Scotchwoman, with nothing at all prepossessing about her in any way. As she turned to leave the room, Lewis said something to her in an undertone. The words, can't come tonight, being emphasised, were alone audible to Dacre. It was a very hot, breathless evening, and after tea they went out into the veranda to smoke. The long windows of the dining room were open behind them, and as they lounged against the posts of the veranda talking, the picture on the wall within looked out at them with its beautiful, passionate eyes. Clytie died away into the shadow that soon began to darken in the room, but the face above caught the last ray of the sunset, and remained a bright spot upon the wall. Dacre and Lewis had so far, by tacit consent, avoided all mention of what was painful in the past, but Dacre had spoken of his intended departure for England, and Lewis understood him and was satisfied. After a time Mrs. MacLeod came to say that Mr. Cunningham was wanted, and he went away, leaving Dacre alone in the veranda. The sun had gone long since, and a lovely moonlight night without a cloud had settled down upon the land. The sky was radiant with stars, and from where Dacre stood he could catch a glimpse of the mountains far away. They stood out with that strange clearness and crystal sharpness of outline which appears to be produced by certain states of the atmosphere in the New Zealand climate, and which brings them miles nearer to one in appearance as long as it lasts. Dacre singled them out with his eye, and in his heart he wished them goodbye like old friends. I shall see no hills in England that will find their way to my heart like those, he thought, and tomorrow I shall turn my back on you old snow rangers, so farewell tonight but he was wishing them farewell too soon. The mountains had not quite done with him yet. The soft clearness and beauty of the night soothed him inexpressibly like a cool hand upon a fevered forehead, and presently his thoughts wandered off in a new direction. I will go back to England, he said to himself, and take up my old work once more. There are more lives than mine in the world, though mine is but a tangle of broken threads. I cannot see the meaning of it at all, but it will all be made clear to me some day, I am persuaded, and waiting for that I will try to throw my might into the master's treasury. After a while Lewis came back, and they talked on as before. It was such a lovely night they could not go in, so they stayed out in the veranda, with the scent of the honeysuckle perfuming the air, and the moonlight making picturesque lights and shadows all around them. How awfully hot it is, said Dacre. There isn't a breath. He stopped suddenly with a violent start. Lewis looked up, and saw that his eyes were fixed on something within the sitting room. Cunningham, he asked the next moment. Who is that picture meant for? Lewis followed the direction of his eyes. The moonlight streamed through the open windows of the sitting room and fell in a broad, bright streak across the picture over the fireplace. The face came forth dead white from the darkness round, 
and it seemed in its strange wild beauty to be looking out and watching the two men in the veranda so eagerly that even Lewis was startled for a moment. He answered Dacre's question in a slow, thoughtful manner. I bought it, he said, of a fellow in Auckland who didn't paint badly. He used to do it for pleasure at a lonely station in Australia, where he had not much else to amuse himself with. He wanted to call this head Charlotte Corday, but I told him I would not have such an association with it for any consideration, for it reminded me of someone whom I, I knew, and that was why I bought it. He persisted, however, to the last, in saying that it was very like what Charlotte Corday must have been. Looking at his companion at last, Lewis saw that Dacre had not heard one word he had said. Dacre was staring at the painting with a face nearly as white as his own. All of a sudden he gasped out, How like that picture is to my wife! What? asked Lewis, growing pale in his turn at last. Like who? Dacre, I never asked you before, but tell me now. Where is your wife? Who was she? She was the Mrs. Keith who came out with us in the Flora MacDonald. Lewis sprang up as if the other man had struck him. Now may God have mercy on us both, he said, for I was married to her two months ago in Christchurch. End of chapter 28 Recording by Lewis Fletcher Chapter 29 of Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher The Third Time we were two sisters of one race. Such a long silence followed Lewis's words, it seemed as if the two men were stricken dumb. You might have counted a hundred, and still neither spoke. They stood confronting each other with white faces, and in a stillness that seemed breathless. Dacre was the first to break the spell. Where is she? he asked, and Lewis answered. She is here. She is within ten yards of you now. Another pause, and then, scarcely above a whisper, he added, Which of us is to tell her? I will, returned Dacre, and let her look to it, for my blood is fairly up at last. Lewis led the way out of the veranda without another word. They crossed the dark sitting room and an equally dark passage beyond. Then Lewis threw open a door and they stepped into a large, well-lighted room, with pretty chintz curtains and ottomans covered with the same, a handsome carved sideboard at one end and some clever watercolour sketches on the walls. There was a table in the centre inlaid with beautiful New Zealand wood of different kinds. Upon this stood books, a few pretty trifles of china and aluminium, and a tete-a-tete -tete tea service of delicate white French china. Last of all, at the further end of the room was a lady seated at a piano, who rose as they entered and faced them. She had not been singing, but merely turning over the leaves of some new music with her teacup in her hand. She set this quietly down on the table, and then drew back a step or two, and seemed to wait their pleasure. To all outward appearance she was not embarrassed in the least. She was beautifully dressed, and in full dress too. Black lace over white silk looped with scarlet roses, and roses to match in her black hair, which was taken up in a splendid coronet of plaits over her head. What fancy could have induced her to attire herself after this magnificent fashion for an evening in a quiet New Zealand station, it is impossible to say. But, however it may have been, this whim of hers was destined to have an effect, and that a wonderful one, upon the scene which followed. Looking at Laura as she stood before him, queenly and magnificent, Dacre was haunted by an idea that there was something strange about her, something peculiar, which made her unlike her usual self, but what gave rise to this notion in his mind he could not make out. Lewis remained standing quietly by the door, which he had carefully closed behind him. It was a dark corner of the room, and he was half hidden in the shadow. Dacre, on the other hand, came forward, but as he advanced, Laura retreated, and when he stopped at last, there were still several paces between them. You must know what I have come here for, Dacre said. Seeing Cunningham and yourself together, you, who have striven so hard to keep us apart, must be aware that your game is up at last. Mightily as his temper was roused, he yet spoke calmly, and repressed his passion with an iron hand. Dacre was a man with a large gift of self-control. He possessed assuredly the greatness of he that ruleth his spirit. Laura did not answer a word. She only gave a quick, uneasy glance at Lewis, standing by the door. I suppose nothing I can say will have much effect, Dacre went on. Not even if I tell you... He came to a sudden stop. What is it? What is it? Himself uneasily. Something was wrong about Laura. What could it be? Suddenly the whole truth flashed upon him. She was standing by the table in front of him, full in the light of the lamp which stood in its centre. 
She was, as before described, in full dress, gold bracelets on her round white arms and a necklace with gold pendants round her beautiful neck. The velvet band was gone. Dacre's eye had found it out. His glance sought out the spot where the scar should have been, where his dog's teeth had met in the white flesh and left an indelible mark years ago. He looked for it, but that too was gone. Then all at once the woman before him drew herself up defiantly, fairly at bay at last. "'You have found it out,' she said, "'and I don't wish to keep it from you any longer. I am not your wife, Laura. Laura is lying on the slope of the hill at Brighton, and I am Beatrice.' "'Beatrice?' Yes, the Beatrice whom you never saw, but whom you were told was the living image of your wife, as time has proved to be the truth. The game is up now, Rilston Dacre, as you said yourself, and I do not care if I set matters right at last in your mind, if not for your sake, for the sake of someone else. She gave another uneasy glance at Lewis, who stood listening like a man stunned, taking no part at all in what went forward. I may as well tell you the whole story from the beginning, she went on, or you will never understand either it or me. It was on the 4th of March, eight years ago, that I, then living with my sister Nora in a quiet little country town in England, received a letter from Laura, dated from Brighton. She was my favourite sister, as you know, and of course I had heard from her all the particulars of her acquaintance with you, formed whilst she fulfilled the duties of governess in your uncle's family. A dependent position, perhaps, but one in which you would have been far kinder to have left her, and afterwards of her marriage. Up to the time when I received her letter, I had always thought of her as happy and contented as your wife. Afterwards, I learned the truth, the truth which rendered me your deadly enemy thenceforward. I did not learn it from her letter, however. That merely told me my sister was ill and alone at Brighton, begging me to go to her at once. I went to Brighton. I went to see and to lose almost the only human being I then really loved. I found Laura in miserable little lodgings with no money, no friends, and dying. That, Rilston Dacre, was the end of your wife. Are you not ashamed to stand before her sister now? When I reached Brighton, it was almost too late. The fever was far too advanced, and she did not know me. She never knew me, except, I think, just at the very last, when speech was gone. But from her broken, delirious wanderings, I gathered that you had treated her very badly, and that you had cast her off to die among strangers. Can you wonder if, seeing her loneliness and misery, I vowed to have revenge? The last day of her life she made an effort to beckon to me with one hand. Rilston, she said faintly, don't let him know, don't let him know. She repeated this brokenly many times over. It was mingled with the incoherent repetition of some other name which I could not distinctly catch, but I think the words suggested to me my revenge. She died. She lies buried there at Brighton. Even now I cannot bear to speak about that time. I went straight home from her grave and wrote to you, but I wrote in Laura's name and merely told you, to prevent the accidental discovery of the death, that I myself was dead. I said, his love for her is over. The tie between them had become a mere clog to him. Very well, I will hold him bound, bound to an imaginary Laura, and as long as I have the power to hinder it, he shall never form another home and take another wife. It was a poor retaliation, perhaps, but it was all that I could think of at the time, and, upon the whole, it appears to have answered better than I could have hoped for. Months passed. My hatred of you began to fade a little. I made up my mind when Nora married to join my other sister in New Zealand, and the day before I sailed I wrote to you. You were in Plymouth then, as I thought, and in that letter I confessed my deceit and directed you where to find your wife's grave, but you never received it. It was not to be. When I met you on board the Flora MacDonald, I saw at once that you mistook me for Laura, Perhaps my being in possession of her watch, which you recognised, assisted the delusion. The old temptation to punish you for your conduct towards her leaped up in a moment, all the more fiercely because I saw, or fancied that I saw, that you were attached towards Lucy Cunningham. I played my part well, I think, on the whole, but it was six years since you had seen Laura, and we were always very much alike. I think the velvet band, which I fortunately recollected in time, made the resemblance complete. She paused a moment with her hand on the gold necklace, which now replaced the velvet she had formerly worn. Lewis's gift, she said gently to herself, with a sudden softening of the great grey eyes and a smile that touched the corners of her mouth. Then to Dacre once more, she added, Arthur Winstanley, who was wild about Laura long ago when he was reading with a tutor in Devonshire, before you married her and ruined her life, was sharper far in his perception than you were. He must have loved her better than you did, for he found me out at once, though at first my great resemblance to Laura cost him a sudden fit of faintness. But I bribed him to silence with the money you paid me for my passage to England, and he is far away in Australia by this time. 
Dacre looked steadily into Beatrice's eyes while she poured out her story, in sentences short and curt, with repressed passion, and it never for an instant occurred to him to doubt that she spoke the truth, not even though she was giving him proof at that very moment of her skill in cool, systematic deception. He saw from her eyes, which looked as they did when she sat by Laura's grave at Brighton long ago, that she was at present desperately in earnest. He was not conscious, however, that at this moment Beatrice, if she had wished to deceive him, dare not have done so. He had no idea what his own face seemed to her at that moment, and how, only a woman after all, she had begun to quail inwardly, and to feel afraid before the righteous wrath of the two men before her. For that Lewis was against her also was evident from something indefinable in his look and position, although he did not speak. Dacre's manner, too, was quite calm. He seemed perfectly unmoved by the contempt she had lavished upon him during the course of her story, and when she was finished he too kept silence for some minutes, until the interval became so awful to Beatrice that she felt obliged to break it in some manner herself. She took up the small bunch of trinkets hanging at her watch chain, and slowly detached from them a wedding ring in its guard, a circle of dead gold set with three turquoises. There, she said, offering them to Dacre, take them back. I took them off your wife's cold hand, and now that they have played their part with me, I can bear to restore them as a token that Laura and you are quits at last. But Dacre put them back decidedly. No, he said, I can't touch those, I never will. You seem to imagine that the wrong throughout lay altogether on my side. Did Laura never speak to you of Captain Rollo? The third time now that this man's name had leaped out of the past, Beatrice turned very pale and looked at Dacre with a vague terror in her eyes. He saw that she was puzzled. You did not know it then, he said. She did not tell you that she chose to leave her husband for that man's sake. That you found her alone, friendless, and without money at Brighton does not surprise me. It was what might have been expected of Rollo. But perhaps you can understand now why I must decline the wedding ring which I put once upon your sister's finger, and why it scarcely strikes me as so very generous of you to forgive me in her name. Beatrice had turned from pale to red, a burning glow covered all her face. She played a moment with the two rings, then refastened them once more to her chain. No doubt, said Dacre as she did so, with the contempt which he felt in his turn, they must be very precious to you as a memento of the sister you so loved and respected. He was sorry for the sneer a moment afterwards, but Beatrice deserved it, and she was not without words in her own defence. I see, she said. I have been a little mistaken. But remember, I never saw Laura until she was past speaking coherently. She could not tell me anything then, and if I have done you wrong, things certainly looked very black against you. Not one word of this made the slightest impression upon Dacre. He did not care for any slight apology that Beatrice might make him. The expression of his face had quite changed, and his brown eyes were brilliant. He had suddenly grasped the idea that he was a free man, and that Lucy was within a few miles of him. Cunningham, he said, turning to Lewis for the first time, I am going. Lewis only nodded. He did not require to ask where. Goodbye, old fellow, said Dacre, holding out his hand as he passed him. Goodbye, said Lewis, returning the salute cordially. They were the first words he had spoken since he entered the room. End of chapter 29. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. Chapter 30 of Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher Broken Beatrice and Lewis were left alone. She was waiting breathlessly for his first words, bending forwards a little with her eyes fixed eagerly on his face, and her beautiful full red lips slightly parted. At last they began to tremble, and she said softly, Oh, Lewis, have you given me up at last? For the first time he was mute and cold to her appeal, and suddenly she threw herself on the ground at his feet with a cry. Oh, Lewis, Lewis Cunningham, she said, don't cast me off. I am really your wife, your own wife, Beatrice. Won't you love me still? He shook his head. She looked up into his face and read the decision, repeated still more pitilessly there in its hard, cold expression. She wrung her hands and began to sob, though without tears, in an almost hysteric passion of terror and agony. The attitude she had thrown herself into was superb, a splendid despairing pose set off by her beautiful dress of silk and lace, the gold drops glittering on her handsome neck, the crimson flowers in her black hair. Lewis waited a moment, then quietly lifted her up and put her on one side. A little too theatrical for my taste, he said coolly. 
he had become hard as granite to the woman to whom up to this hour he had yielded willing homage, the one woman Lewis Cunningham had ever been in love with. There stood on the table in the centre of the room a little tea service of white china. Lewis, in that very room, two hours before, had taken tea, sitting it by his wife's side, and had kissed the hand that offered him his cup. His eye fell on the little teacup, thin and fragile as an eggshell, standing just where he had put it down at the beginning of the evening. Suddenly he dashed his foot upon it, shattering it into a thousand tiny fragments. There, he said, do you see that? I could as soon pick up those pieces and make that cup just as it was before, as I could gather up and mend my old love for you. It is no thanks to you if my sister's heart is not already broken. You have stained your hands with an awful sin, Beatrice. Look to it. He turned away with the last words and left the room, leaving Beatrice quite alone. She remained for a long time, how long she never quite knew, lying just as Lewis had left her. She had attained her revenge at last, and in doing so had attained to the very bitterest hour of all her life. Repent as much as she would and wish to undo the past, it was now too late. How fearfully too late Beatrice had yet to learn. At last she raised her head and looked round her. The room was just as it had been left some hours before, the tea things were standing about. The lamp was burning brightly. The light seemed so comfortable and brilliant it felt like a mockery in her present mood. She got up and extinguished the lamp, leaving the room to be illuminated only by a ray of moonlight which glimmered past the edge of the window curtain. The darkness is best for such as I am, she said to herself. Then she threw herself on the sofa and sobbed, with her face hidden in the cushions. He will never love me again as he did, she moaned and I was growing so happy with him. Laura, I have lost all by my mad fidelity to you. At last, her ear caught the sound of a horse's hoof upon the gravel outside. She got up and, lifting the curtain, looked out. By the light of the moon, she saw Lewis ride off on his favourite horse at a brisk pace. He will never come back, she said despairingly. Oh, if I could only undo the past and be Mrs. Keith on board the Flora MacDonald once more. Her repentance, so far as it went, was very genuine, but it was a selfish repentance after all. And ah, Beatrice, you will have to learn that, though we repent of our sins, we cannot repair the mischief they have caused. Only one can do that, and he will do it only in his own way and at his own time. End of chapter 30 Recording by Lewis Fletcher Chapter 31 of Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. The Slope of the Hill. How bright the stars looked that night, and how gloriously the moon shone. There was no wind, none, not a breath. But what mattered the intense, oppressive heat? What would have signified cold, thirst, hunger, anything at that moment to Dacre? Was not Lucy there before him, beckoning him on? She was as vivid and distinct to his mind's eye as if she had really been there in bodily presence, hovering before his horse's head as he rode on. He could see the lovely silky ripples of her hair, the hair which he had always admired so much, the little head set so gracefully upon her shoulders, the sweet face smiling as only Lucy could smile, for him. Dacre had seen during his life many far more beautiful women than Lucy, but not one of them could have been to him what she was. She was simply Lucy and no other did he want, no one else, however lovely or fascinating, Lucy just as she was, and Lucy only. When a man loves in this unreasoning way, the lady of his choice need have no fears of any rival. She is queen of his heart, let what will come, and no other can ever dispute her sovereignty. Dacre rode fast, the road lengthened behind him, shortened in front, how short it was growing now, how near he was to the end. The mountains were on his left hand, he caught glimpses of them now and then between the hills among which he was riding, but he knew that he should not see them in their full glory until he crested the hill which looked down on Maungarewa, for of course he meant to take the shortest track. Who would go round another mile, however easy the way might be, with such an end in view? Certainly not Dacre. It was eleven o'clock when he began to ascend that hill. Would he find them up, or would the Maungarewa household have all retired quietly to rest? He was afraid so, and yet he knew that Mr. Cunningham was given to sitting up late on a hot night like this, smoking in the veranda or anywhere he fancied was the coolest. With Mr. Cunningham, Dacre had no fears of a rejection. He knew that Mr. Cunningham would be well pleased to hear of his attachment to Lucy. The brow of the hill at last, and the great mountain range burst upon him in its everlasting splendour, but the house was in sight, and he had no eyes for anything else. 
He held his breath for a moment as he looked downwards, and then with a sigh of relief became aware that there was more than one light still shining from its different windows. The terror, lest he should see them extinguished as he gazed, sent him down the slope with a fresh impulse of eagerness, a fresh touch of the spur to his horse. But it was a steep bit of ground and rocky, not exactly suited to a night ride. Dacre's horse stumbled, slipped, picked itself up again, went all right for a few paces further, then, as its master looked away once more to the lights below him, suddenly took the opportunity, stumbled again and fell, rolling over Dacre and crushing in his side. A blank of utter darkness, and then a slow creeping back to life, life once more for a short space of suffering. The cup which seemed so full of sweetest nectar a little while ago was nearly empty now. Only the last few drops, how bitter, remained to drink. With his own clear surgical knowledge, Dacre became aware that he was dying. He could not move or raise himself in the least, but his fall had left him on his back, with his face turned up to the night sky, and when his senses slowly returned to him, the first thing he was conscious of was the heaven above and the stars. They looked brighter than ever, and the great arch seemed greater and more solemn than ever before. So too did the mountains on the left, exquisitely mistily purple in the moonlight, glorious everlasting hills. They looked down calmly and solemnly on this little unit of humanity writhing beneath them, and seemed to hush the awful cry of anguish in his heart, for as Dacre lay he could see Maungarewa beneath him. The house, the windows shining still, lay clear before his eyes. He could see the window of Lucy's room, could see a shadow pass from side to side upon the blind, so near and yet so utterly separated from him now. It seemed as though all the life within him threw itself into one great cry of agony at the sight, and he fainted once more. Another weary, painful resurrection after a longer space of time, and the stars were looking at him still. Oh, those bright stars! And oh, those lovely lilac peaks so far away! What was it they were saying? Something that grew upon him more and more clearly as the hours of the night slipped by. Dacre was very near home. His feet had nearly reached the gates of the golden city whose cornerstone is Christ. Surely some faint reflex of the radiance, some dim echo of the eternal harmony was wafted to him that night, through the mountains and the stars, to bind up the broken heart. For, as far as this life went, he was broken-hearted. Every hope that he had cherished seemed to have slipped from him one by one. This last ride of his, what was it but the crowning failure of it all? But what matter? What was it he was losing after all? The desire of life was failing now with Dacre, and as these earthly shadows grew dim to his eyes, the great eternal realities began to unveil themselves more and more clearly before him. It seemed as though the meaning of his life, and all that he had ever gone through, was gradually unrolling before his inward vision, and the love of Christ our Redeemer was being made plain to him as he had never seen it before. Deep peace flowed slowly into his heart, a peace that nothing could shake. In the paroxysms of agony he passed through as he lay helpless there, and in his moments of relief from pain, it was still with him, making him more than conqueror. He could look down at last at the little window beneath him, and see the light extinguished there quite calmly. As he lay alone during those long, weary night watches, it was as though the whole of his life came up in review before him. Dacre had been an orphan ever since he could remember. Not the faintest image of either father or mother lingered on his memory, but he was a little child again in his uncle's house, and stood knee-deep in mountain grass, and heard his native breezes pass and runlets babbling down the glen. It seemed to him that he really felt the cool breeze upon his hot brow, and the murmur of the stream where he used to spend whole days trout fishing was in his ears as well. Then he was a boy at Eton, playing in a cricket match at Lord's, and oh, so proud of the laurels he had won there. Very perishable laurels, long since sere and withered. He was at Oxford, he was studying for the profession he had chosen, not of necessity, for with Dacre money had always been plentiful, but because he loved work and was miserable idle. Then the lights grew brighter as the darker shadows brought them out into stronger relief. He was in the midst of his infatuation for Laura, governess then in his uncle's household. He was drinking the cup of a costly death. He was passing through the gradual fading of his illusions after his marriage. She had left him for Rollo. He had given up the army, had worked hard among the poor of a large English town, had, lastly, taken passage in the ship Flora MacDonald, the ship which had been a fatal one to him, and where he had come under the influence of the attraction which had power to hold him to New Zealand ever since. All the old faces from the past came up and looked at Dacre as he lay there. Some of them spoke to him in old familiar tones, and hands, many of which were dust now, were put forth for him to shake. 
In his delirious wandering, he exchanged jokes with his old brother officers. Laura flashed defiance on him from her great grey eyes, and Rollo's dark brows scowled on him over her shoulder. Then, strangely enough, Rollo called up Clinton Meredith, and last rose Lucy's soft round face, and beside that the others grew dim and fainted out. The night wore itself away at last, a night that had been years to the dying man, and the dawn a lovely pearly transparent light spread and brightened in the sky every moment. His head felt clearer now, and he wondered dreamily when and by whom he would be found, and how they would break it to Lucy. Would she hear the story Beatrice had told him, and know that he was on his way to her, dying almost at her feet? Yes, he could trust Lewis to tell her all that had passed. He wondered what had become of his horse. It had disappeared long since. The sun was up at last, and now the glorious sunshine smote him on the face. It must have been very early in the morning, but he had lost all count of time, when he saw that the house beneath him was astir once more. A girl's figure, oh, Dacre, you knew it well, came out of the door at the side facing him, and Lucy stood a few moments, looking round her and drinking in the fresh, cool morning air. She wore her riding habit, and when she gathered it up with one hand and walked away, Dacre became certain that she was going to catch her horse. He was not mistaken. She returned in a short time, leading Robin Hood, and Mr. Cunningham came out of the house and saddled him for her. The English mail was in, and Lucy was going to give herself the pleasure of an early ride to fetch the letters. Her father put her on the saddle. Dacre could see it all quite plainly from where he lay. At the bottom of the hill she paused a moment, evidently considering which way to take. Her hesitation only lasted a moment, however, then she came riding up the slope straight as a bird flies to the spot where he was lying. She did not usually choose this way. What subtle instinct urged her to do so now? Between Dacre and herself, however, there lay a small creek, which must be crossed by anyone ascending or descending the hillside. Here she stopped to let her horse drink. How little she thought that each mouthful of water it swallowed answered to another throb of the ebbing life above her. The suspense while she loitered there was almost too much for Dacre, but it was over at last, and she came on faster now. He could hear her singing an air she had taken a great fancy to lately, the last rose of summer, as Robin Hood breasted the slope. The sweet, sad notes which seemed to hover up and precede her were only too mournfully true. The first roses of Lucy's summer faded with Effie Lennox, the last went with Dacre. Another moment and she rose before him, a bright vision with the sunshine on her face and rippling hair. End of chapter 31 Recording by Lewis Fletcher Chapter 32 of Over the Hills and Far Away A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher A Charge The Glory That Is Brighter Than the Sun Dacre managed to explain everything to her gradually, and by a few words at a time, and he begged her to forgive Beatrice. Poor Beatrice, he said. I thought a few hours ago that I could never have done it, but one sees things differently when one is near death. So once more Lucy heard and remembered a charge from dying lips. He would not let her go for help. I should not last till you got back, he said. Don't leave me now. As she knelt beside him in the morning sunlight, supporting his head, he passed one of his hands, which he could still move, over her hair. Your beautiful hair, he said, then. Open the locket on my watch guard. Do you see that? How soft and bright it is. Do you know when I got that precious little lock? It was the night you fainted. You never knew. Ah, yes, he went on presently. I have been all wrong, all wrong. I forgot who said that a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things that he possesseth. I coveted you, you, Lucy, and I thought my life was spoiled because I could not have you. But he has forgiven me, and after that nothing seems hard to bear. If he requires my life, my poor worthless life, shall I grudge it to him? He began to speak with greater difficulty, pausing often, and resuming with a greater effort every time the broken words. Do you remember, he said, the hymn you sometimes sing? Dark darth hath been the midnight, but day spring is at hand, and glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. The dark night is over now with me. I have learnt to see the meaning of the words. There is no glory here, nothing lasts, nothing satisfies. We thirst with a thirst which no earthly draught can slake, but I am going where all is real and the glory is brighter than the sun. You won't forget me, Lucy, and you will come soon. A long pause, and then once more he rallied a little, and said brokenly, Once you sang that on board ship, 
I remember your dress was white, the wind lifted your hair. I think I always loved you from that day. That was all. He lay for some minutes quite unconscious, and only roused up for a few moments of agony that wrung Lucy's heart. When they were over he could not speak, but he knew her still and seemed to comprehend the anguish in her face. If he could, he would have tried to comfort her, but the power was gone. His brown eyes looked at her wistfully, and Lucy understood their meaning. She made a great effort and steadied her voice. I will come soon, she said, and the Lord watch between thee and me while we are absent the one from the other. She saw that he was comforted for her. How long did this last? Was it hours or only minutes? And was he really gone? She could not leave him, she could only kneel and pray. At last a shadow came between her eyes and the sun. A horseman riding down the hill above them, Lewis Cunningham, sprang off and came to her side. He had followed Dacre with the early morning light, but alas, too late. Dacre's eyes opened once more. He knew Lewis and made an effort to move one hand. Lewis took it in his, and Dacre smiled and said, Yes, Lewis was sure he caught the words, My friend. Then he turned his eyes, not sad now, but radiant with a light brighter than the morning sunshine, to Lucy, and with a last struggle to speak, he said, quite clearly, My wife. End of chapter 32 Recording by Lewis Fletcher Chapter 33 of Over the Hills and Far Away, A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lewis Fletcher. Forgiven. Through the night time, while thou sleepest, still I watch the shrouded east. Beatrice waited until she could bear her solitude no longer, then she set off alone on her horse to Maungarewa. Lewis was standing in the veranda. He made no effort to help her dismount, and the face he turned towards her was hard as stone. Beatrice's heart died within her. She tried to speak, but the words would not come. At last she said, Will nothing soften you? Is Dacre always to stand between you and me, now that I am sorry for the past? Lewis looked at her sternly. She noticed, for the first time, that he was dressed in mourning. Be as sorry as you like, he answered. That won't bring him back to life again. Beatrice sprang off her horse, perfectly awestruck. He is not dead, she gasped out. He was buried yesterday, said Lewis, and turned away. He would have left her quite alone, but Lucy came from somewhere behind him and took Beatrice's hand and led her into the house. Had not Dacre told her to forgive, and must she not keep her word? Once within the house, the two women stood and looked at one another in silence. As they confronted each other in the first chapter of the story, so they once more met, after each had gained some bitter experience, and learnt to know the other perhaps only too well. Lucy's face had much pity in it. Beatrice's was almost transformed by an unwanted expression of humility. She clung to Lucy's hand like a child. Lewis, said his sister, come here. Lewis, who was not far off, followed them into the drawing room. At that time his reverence for his sister's sorrow would have made him do anything she asked. I only wanted to say one thing to you, Lucy went on, with the weary intonation she could never at times quite banish from her voice again. Beatrice was left to my charge, and I think you can fulfil the trust better than I can. Did Dacre forgive me? asked Beatrice softly. He forgave you entirely, Lucy said, and she saw that great tears were running down the other woman's cheeks. He was very sorry for you when he lay dying. How I injured him, Beatrice replied. Never was greater injustice done than mine to Rilston Dacre. She sank softly to the ground and hid her face in the dark folds of her riding habit, but Lewis was conquered at last. There were tears in his eyes too, and he lifted his wife once more to her feet. The surf of the Pacific roars and thunders not far from Dacre's grave, but it only serves to enhance the peace of the little valley where he lies. Standing by his grave, Lucy can now look forward and feel nothing but a solemn joy at the remembrance of her lost love, for he is gone, she thinks. He is happy. He is singing Hosanna in the highest. End of Over the Hills and Far Away A Story of New Zealand by Charlotte Evans